Yeah, my name is Michael Hall. I'm a medical oncologist at Fox Chase Cancer Center. I'm the chairman of the Department of Clinical Genetics here. And I also am the co-leader of the Cancer Prevention and Control Program. I, I actually got interested in medicine because I had a, a parent who, uh, my mother was a nurse, and I just found uh, sort of the stories of, of medicine uh, uh, interesting and compelling. So my interest in, in sort of genetics and, and Lynch syndrome then started really during my fellowship training at Chicago. I was mentored by uh, sort of a giant uh, in the field. Her name is Fumi Olapade. She was a, a, a major force in uh, BRCA1, BRCA2 research. Uh, but at the same time, I was, I was interested in being a GI oncologist, not a breast oncologist, which at that point, BRCA was really just focused on breast. So she said to me, well, if you're going to be interested in GI oncology, you, you need to get interested in the, in the GI syndromes. And um, I first started out being interested in pancreas cancer, uh, and then that sort of evolved over time to being more interested in the GI syndromes like Lynch syndrome uh, and FAP. And I, I think what's been amazing about Lynch syndrome research over just the short time of my career is when I first started in this field, everyone looked at Lynch syndrome as this incredibly rare thing and and then in just a few short years, you know, we've seen Lynch syndrome with the emergence of immunotherapy with some great research coming out of uh, the Australian group and others showing that, that this is, and Ohio State group, I should say, just showing that this disease is actually incredibly, incredibly common in the population. I, I think the the total turnaround has been really a um, uh, sort of an eye opener to me about how how much science can change over a short period of time. But it also has then opened up, I think, a big opportunity for us to identify uh, a large swath of the population who have this very common risk that we can actually do something about. Um, uh, and, and so that's, I think that's been really inspiring as well. I, I, I say to my patients all the time, Lynch syndrome is, is a risk. It's like uh, driving your car without a seatbelt. <laughs> uh, you 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 can you could drive all over town without a seatbelt on and never have something happen to you. But Lynch syndrome is that risk that if you did have an accident, uh, you know something could happen. And and so so this is a, uh, a, a inherited risk in one of uh, four genes that we know are related to uh, editing and repairing uh, small mistakes that get made in an individual's DNA uh, when that DNA is being replicated uh, or when it gets damaged. Usually it's because uh, when our cells replicate, um, the, the, uh, the, the enzymes that are in place in our cells to replicate our DNA and, and form two new cells, they, that has to happen very quickly. We have billions and billions of cells. So those enzymes have to work really fast and they, they make mistakes along the way. And, and human beings are, uh, have, have a lot of amazing backup uh, uh, pathways that if those mistakes get made, they, there, there are, there are groups of genes and enzymes that come in to repair those mistakes. And Lynch syndrome is one of those family of genes called the mismatch repair uh, pathway. Um, and so there are very specific times when our, our cells and our bodies need that pathway to work. And uh, individuals with Lynch syndrome have a risk that that pathway can get disabled. Um, and if, that, dis if that, that pathway gets disabled, there can be an accumulation of small mutations that, that happen throughout uh, important genes. And, and those that accumulation of mutations and the, the dysfunction of those genes ultimately can lead to cancer. At the same time, uh, what's been discovered in recent years is that that pathogenic process of those mutations accumulating is actually very, very distinct to people with Lynch syndrome. And so uh, we've been able to harness that distinctness and the ability of our immune systems to recognize the, the tumor, uh, the, the process of tumors forming in Lynch syndrome to use immunotherapies to help our own immune systems basically uh, turn on a Lynch syndrome cancer. And we've seen 
you know, in the, in the medical literature, I've had a, a number of, of patients in my practice and, and, and the examples now are all over the place uh, of people who have, who have sometimes metastatic cancer with Lynch syndrome who can be cured with immunotherapies. Now this, uh, you know, unfortunately doesn't happen for everyone, but, but the, the chances are actually pretty good. And, and so this is, this, is, this is how this syndrome works. It is basically a risk of accumulating these mutations. Um, and again, if, if one is lucky, that risk may, may never play out in the formation of a cancer. However, we know that risk is elevated compared to average uh, risk individuals in the population. So the classic uh, group of cancers, uh, especially colon cancer, is 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 always going to be near or at the top of the list. Um, you know, in that there are these four, uh, some people say five genes that contribute to Lynch syndrome. Uh, two or three of the genes are actually higher risk to develop colon cancer. Um, endometrial cancer uh, is also uh, at the top of the list, particularly for uh, for women who have uh, uteruses. Then there are others, uh, ovarian cancer, gastric cancer. We do sometimes see small bowel and pancreatic cancers. We can see cancers of the ureters. Um, and then there are some Lynch syndrome families who can get uh, skin manifestations as well. Uh, that that uh, They're not uh, as much cancers as they are kind of growths that you wanna get rid of if you get them. The answer, uh, the, the best answer I wanna say is that Lynch syndrome is common enough that I think any young patient or any patient, I should say, really who has colorectal cancer, if not now, but in the near future, really should be tested for this syndrome. There's some great data out of the Ohio State group and others showing that, um, you know, certainly if you test into, uh, patients with, with colorectal cancer under the age of 50, you're going to find that about eight or 9% of those colon cancers have Lynch syndrome. If you test over 50, it's going to be a smaller chunk, but it's still going to be a pretty significant, you know, percentage of people. And if you look overall at all colon cancers, Lynch syndrome comes in roughly about 2.8 to 3% of all colon cancers. And that's, and that's common. And especially because, we have great ways to screen these folks. We have other things we can do. You know, there are emerging new prevention uh, approaches. So with a disease that that's common, that's that common, I think we should really be testing everyone. Testing has become much more accessible, much cheaper. Um, uh, so I, I think what we're seeing is national guidelines, which, uh, you know, full disclosure, I'm part of some of them shifting in a direction uh, of, of making this kind of testing and recommending this testing for all colon patients. And, and I, I think it will not be too many years before that is fully endorsed by the whole medical community. I, I mean, honestly, there have been some great data um, uh, from Jewel Samater's group from, um, from Mayo Clinic showing the Basically, if you take all comers with any kind of cancer and you test them with a large gene panel, you're going to have roughly about a 10% chance that you're going to find some relevant gene that uh, relates to people's risk of cancer that's actionable and meaningful. And so that tells me that really everyone with a diagnosis of cancer should have access to hereditary genetic testing if they want it. Not everyone wants it. I, I think the tougher question is, how do we test everyone else, right? If, if you're testing patients with cancer, you're behind the eight ball, right? What we want to do is test people who are frankly in their 20s and 30s who have their lives ahead of them, can plan ahead, can think about, am I going to smoke or not? Am I going to drink or not? Am I going to exercise or not? Because that's where we can really make an impact on preventing cancer in the population and identifying those folks for whom we should focus resources like frequent colonoscopy and, and other things versus individuals who don't have to worry about that. I mean, I think the clues like that, mom had ovarian cancer, huge red flag, right? You need to get testing. Um, but I think that uh, uh, the, again, we can use information from uh, what we call more population genetics to help individuals understand what risks they may be facing. So again, really, I'll tell you sort of a couple of things just based on your question, a, a nice study out of the uh, UK showed that um, uh, if you just tested lots of folks 
for Lynch syndrome, not based on family history, you're going to find meaningful mutations uh, in many folks who never have a family history of cancer. But those mutations, those folks can still go on to get cancer themselves. So family history helps you, but it's far from being perfect. And when you think of a world where this is a common disease and testing is relatively cheap, you know, most most of us, I can tell you, being in this business, it's much nicer to know you have a risk and prevent than get treated. It does, sure, and, and this gets back to the um, the especially the immunotherapy part is that um, you know Lynch syndrome, like I said, uh, immunotherapy really put Lynch syndrome on the map a few years ago, and that's because uh, there was an aha moment in science that was huge that actually um, uh, these these Lynch syndrome tumors, and it doesn't matter whether it's a colon cancer or endometrial cancer, whatever they. Um, in this process of these DNA mistakes that 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 happen in the tumor, um, there are uh, there are proteins produced that are that, that are sort of non-native to our body. There are these little kind of fragments of proteins that our cells wouldn't normally make, and our immune system uh, or a patient's immune system recognizes those and realizes that those shouldn't be there. And the tumors very quickly. Uh, hide away from the immune system. I, I think of it when I describe it to my patients as like they put up little umbrellas to kind of hide under. This therapy that was developed um, and came onto the market a few years ago, uh, what we call uh, immune checkpoint bl blockade or anti-PD-1, PDL one therapy basically is able to take down those umbrellas allow the immune system to swoop in. And like I said, in a, in a large number, although not 100% of cases, can sometimes allow an immune system to completely control a tumor, if, if not cure it. Um, so it is incredibly important these days for patients to be tested early on, especially in colon, endometrial, and several other tumors, to find out whether their tumor is MSI high or looks more like Lynch syndrome versus not. Yeah, so there there has been some really, there's been sort of a long, as is often the story of medicine, there's been lots of great research over the years by uh, particularly a group uh, uh, in Germany, but they're not alone, but a, a scientist, very smart scientist, Matthias Klur, and, uh, 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 and the team that, that he works with in Germany, looking at, again, these these, these peptide fragments that these tumors make that, that, that the immune system recognizes and sort of analyzing them, purifying those and, and basically developing vaccines that would be able to stimulate the immune system to recognize those and hopefully enhance the immune response. Uh, and they also identified those peptides that were common across lots of different Lynch syndrome tumors like endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer. There, there are ones that are, com that are commonly produced by all tumors. So then immunize people or boost their immune response. So there are some trials now going on. Um, there, there's uh, uh, at least uh, two that are, one that's ongoing in the US that, that I'm part of uh, based uh, out of an MD Anderson consortium. There, there are multiple ways these days, and I think that's ultimately a good thing. Um, it, it used to be that you had to come sort of to, to a center like this, like Fox Chase, where I work. You you had to go through a, a, what we call the clinic-based high-risk program. Sometimes those programs would have a long wait to get in. That's still an option for patients, um, but uh, and I think that's a good option. I do think, I, I firmly believe that patients who are having this kind of testing need to have genetic counseling. Um, but, I, but I think what's nice in 2023 is there are more ways to go about that. There are now ways that patients can get sometimes testing through their primary care providers. Um, providers either may have um, some access uh, to genetic counseling, either remotely, or sometimes the genetic testing companies they're using may have their own counselors. I, I, the main thing I would caution patients who went through that route, if they went through either their primary care provider, we also sometimes see GYN practices offering this, is I really believe that, again, genetic counseling is really an integral part of this and to not have that be part of it, I think is a problem. The, the other way that frankly is out there is that um, th there are some what we call sort of more direct to consumer ways that testing is available um, uh, where patients can go online. Uh, there is a company where they can, uh, the, the, the company has its sort of own 
online doctor and there's online counseling and, and they can send patients a kit. Um, you know, it, I, I think it's, it's not my preference for patients, especially patients who may have concerns or may have lower health literacy who need more help in, with the decision-making process. But I, again, I think, I do think that option has a place for patients who may be otherwise reluctant to come through a big cancer center or, you know, may have concerns. It, it, you know, it allows patients to, to sort of do the testing outside of sort of their health insurance. I, you know, I think that there are, again, pluses and minuses to it, but I, 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 I think it has a place. Um, and so that all of those exist um, uh, for, for patients as ways uh, to get tested. Now, only 15 years later, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of doing this much broader uh, 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 pre-counseling for, for patients. Um, and, but we really then focus on um, the results counseling afterwards because, you know, especially when patients are getting panels of 80 plus genes, you, you couldn't possibly counsel for every sort of gene individually. So it's a really fascinating how it's changed. You need to know, um, you know, what what are the pros and cons uh, of that approach, and and, and it, you know, it's not infrequent that that when we're discussing our cases uh, weekly with with my counseling team, there will be patients who come along who who just wanted to sort of keep their their testing simple. They don't they don't want the the fifty or the hundred gene panel. They they just want to focus on either twelve, you know, breast cancer or colon cancer genes, because they don't want all of that risk of distracting information and. I think it's just important for people to understand that they do have those choices before they jump into this. So hopefully one day we'll see that, that, you know, the amount that a doc gets for, or I should say a doc or a provider gets for spending time with someone to test them for Lynch syndrome, to counsel them correctly, to help them understand how, what they can do about that risk should be reimbursed as, as well as, you know, treating a cancer down the line or, or at least some parity uh, in those two. I, I love to talk about this subject because it really has been pretty amazing to be part of it all and uh, being part of this mission of trying to uh, uh, understand this disease better and help the patients is really, uh, you know, learn about this is, is really, really pretty uh, amazing stuff. So. Thank you.